Hi everyone, uh, so welcome to our uh, workshop today. Uh, today, uh, Nilu Ravae will uh, explain you how to do uh, smart contract development and uh, Ethereum development. Uh, so I'm going to now hand the uh, host to, uh, to, uh, to, to Nilu and uh, please enjoy, thank you. Sorry guys, <laughs> hey, um, I'm Milu. Uh, let me just bring my video up as well, just kind of make. Is my video live or? Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. If I can't share myself, then my screen's what really matters. Just give me one second. Cool. Um, so I have my screen now. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Nilu. I'm an instructor at Block Geeks. Um, and today, uh, I'm just going to walk you guys through um, basically how to write your first app. First of all, like a little introduction to what a blockchain is and how, I guess, how it works or what its purpose is or when you should really use it. Um, and then we're just going to go uh, through some hands-on experience with um, writing a smart contract uh, and then deploying it. Uh, locally and then having a front-end application kind of speak to it. So kind of making like your own DAP. So um, let's get started. <laughs> Let me just share my screen with you guys and then we can be on our way. Cool. Cool. Um, so before we get started, let me just tell you guys a little bit about who we are and what we do. So I'm an instructor at uh, a company called Block Geeks. Um, and what we do is we work on getting uh, blockchain engineering talent into the space. So we're working on getting developers who are either, um, they have development experience from before, maybe being like a full stack developer or a web developer, or even they don't have any experience. Um, and we kind of have courses online that help them kind of get ramped up and actually work in the space um, as blockchain engineers. Um, and we do in-person workshops, we have hackathons, uh, and we have free articles and, and guides as well. Um, and one of the things, of, two important things about our platform is that we work really closely with a lot of the companies in the space. So we have, um, you know, we have a lot of partner courses that really kind of dive into how to work with platforms that actual companies in the space are building on and that you need to know how to use to be able to work in the space. Um, and we're also updating our uh, courses very, very rapidly because, you know, this industry moves so fast. So we're adding new courses. We're changing, updating things on a weekly basis, which you won't really find uh, with other platforms that kind of sell you one package um, and then don't really touch it. Right. So um, that's a little bit about us. Um, but enough of that. So let's dive in. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what a blockchain actually is. Um, so blockchain, in, a, in essence, is just a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, network that preserves a state. So if you guys think about like um, a typical kind of interaction online, um, most interactions right now happen on a client-server model. So you have a company or an institution like Facebook or Amazon, and they have a bunch of databases where they store your information and they store the information of everybody that you interact with. And then if you want to, let's say, you know, talk to somebody over Facebook Messenger, you would have to send Facebook uh, a request with the message that you want to send. Facebook stores your message in their database and then allows the other person to basically access them and read the mes message as well. So um, Facebook kind of acts as a middleman, right? Um, but in a kind of peer-to-peer -peer environment, you wouldn't really be... Um, you wouldn't be using Facebook or anything. Like you would be directly interacting with the person. Um, so you would directly send your message to that person's computer. There would be no database in the middle uh, to kind of mitigate that transaction. Um, and so this problem, uh, or I guess like what 
like this peer-to-peer -peer network has has existed for a really really long time but um the problem with it has always been you couldn't really uh, you needed faith institutions like Facebook because you didn't trust the other person. So let's say if you're doing like monetary transactions, right? And you don't trust the other person and you're not sure um, if you pay them money, if they're gonna deliver you what they promised to deliver you. So you would have something like Amazon in the middle that would kind of mitigate the risk and would say, hey, if this person doesn't deliver, um, I have the power to take the money from their account, you know? And so it kind of puts Amazon in the middle and it allows you to be able to transact. Um, and so, the reason peer-to-peer -peer networks uh, weren't really widely adopted or really used in kind of a blockchain setting for a really long time was because they you couldn't have this problem when you're dealing directly you couldn't have somebody in the middle to solve this problem but what blockchains really did and what bitcoin really did which was kind of really interesting and crazy was um, they created a kind of uh, cryptographic uh, system or like a computer like a programmed system that basically played with economic incentives and just made it so that people wouldn't cheat the system and would help the, would help the system so if you guys if you guys think about like rational people um in any kind of situation you would cheat because you would the chances of you making money uh, are more if you cheat so what the kind of blockchain system does is it kind of plays with rewards and punishments on the system uh, in a way that if you tried to cheat, you would actually lose more money than if you tried to help the system. So everybody in that sense wants to help the system. And so you kind of have this assurance that you can trust other people because unless somebody is kind of, um, you know, not rational, then this situation wouldn't happen, right? And people would always work in the benefit of the system. So having said that, um, a big question that I come across a lot is, especially around this hype around blockchains, is when is it useful for us to use a blockchain? Or when, which kinds of applications need a blockchain? And a lot of applications honestly don't. Especially, like a lot of times I see people who want to do like big databases on the blockchain and it's like, well, it's a lot slower and you, you, could, you could do a lot better with like a distributed uh, cloud-based system, right? Um, but the kinds of applications that need blockchains are essentially whenever you want to transact without a middleman. So whenever you want to, um, you know, have a sort of uh, maybe financial or sort of like value transfer without um, having to rely on, um, without having to give the power to some sort of external institution, right? So right now, like for a bank, for me and you to, trans to transact through a bank transaction or through like a financial transaction, we need a bank because we need someone to hold the record of events. And for us, so if we want to dispute with each other of what happened first, uh, we need to go to the bank and the bank kind of resolves the dispute. Or let's say if you're doing kind of like a house trend, like trying to buy a house, right? You would need to put money in with like escrow, and then once the house deed changes hands, then the money gets released. So in these kinds of interactions, you always need some sort of third party, trusted third party to sort of mitigate these transactions. So if you wanted to create an application or a platform where you could have these transactions without relying on that third party, you would use a blockchain for that. So the blockchain kind of replaces that trust that you would otherwise place into kind of a third party person. Um, another thing that blockchains are really useful for is reprogramming incentives. So there's a lot of times or a lot of instances where the incentives that are in place for a particular task um, aren't useful. So they kind of promote negative behavior. So like one, one great example is um, if you guys think about like fake news and sort of like clickbait articles, right? So the way that the kind of Facebook ads and sort of articles on the internet work is the more clicks an article gets, uh, the more uh, money that article makes. So it kind of promotes a lot of people to basically post things that aren't true or post titles that sound really exciting just to get people to click. So like the incentive there is to get as many clicks as possible. But if you were able to create a system that would reprogram those incentives so that if your article was fake or it wasn't ver like, uh, verifiably true, um, you would actually lose money versus if it was true, you would gain money. So you're kind of reprogramming the way the incentives are working there so that you're essentially guiding people's behaviors to the way that you want them to behave or to the correct 
course of action, basically. Um, and one application that's really doing that right now um, is this uh, application called Civil, and they're part of like uh, they're part of Consensus, and they're basically exactly doing this, right? They're reprogramming incentives to make sure that people are rewarded for articles that are true and that represent real journalism rather than kind of clickbait articles. So that would be another scenario. So if you guys see anywhere where the incentives that are currently in place are guiding people towards the wrong uh, sort of behavior. Um, and then the last kind of big use case for blockchains is, sorry, is traceability and transparency. So especially between multiple actors. So if you have a kind of uh, system of transactions where you need to work with, you know, 30 or 40 different other companies and each company takes one part of the uh, sort of entire process. So you can think about like shipping companies, right, uh, or tracking shipping or supply chains where you're working with like many different organizations across the entire world and you want to have, first of all, transparency of data. So if something goes wrong or if you know, something is defective, you can trace it and track it very quickly. And you want to have simple and efficient uh, interactions between these people. So whether or not it's transferring funds or having visibility to data or being able to communicate information quickly, you want to have that uh, be really transparent and, uh, and easy to see rather than kind of the systems that we have right now where, you know, each kind of entity holds one part of the data or one part of the information and the communications between these uh, systems are really cumbersome and you have like duplicate records and you don't even know really what the true, you, you can't track one item from its birth all the way to the end. Uh, and so one situation where, especially in the enterprise setting, blockchains are becoming really useful is supply chains um, and kind of like tracking shipping or tracking, you know, um, provenance of things, so whether or not something was sourced ethically or whether or not, um, you know, the, the contents in it were all kind of, uh, like, for example, for, for, for pharmaceuticals, right, whether or not the um, contents in a particular drug were all sourced correctly or just being able to track that everything that you're accessing is, um, is verified, basically. Um, so these are essentially the uh, purposes of a blockchain in general. Um, and the way that Bitcoin and Ethereum play into this is that Bitcoin was the very first implementation of a blockchain or essentially a crypto economic system that changed incentives so that they, so that you didn't have to rely on a third party um, authority. Um, and so Bitcoin was all it did was trying to be digital cash. So I just wanted to say that I can transfer money to you and I can send and receive money from another person the same way that I would send and receive money with cash, like without having to rely on a bank, but digitally, right? Because with cash, you, you can have money, uh, you can change hands very easily, but at the same time, you don't have, um, like you need to be in the same place as that person, right? And, it's, and especially if you wanted to store large amounts of cash, um, it would be taking up a lot of physical space. So it's not very efficient in that way. So Bitcoin just wanted to take the um, kind of not having to rely on any kind of third party or a bank that you get with having cash uh, with um, the flexibility and ease of having a digital system. Um, and so once Bitcoin kind of came to be and after a couple of years had passed, people started to see that, wow, this really works. This idea of having a mechanical system sort of play with incentives to kind of uh, manufacture us to behave in a particular way actually does work. Um, and so based on that, a bunch of people started to think, well, if this works, what else can we use this kind of system for? What other kinds of applications other than just sending and receiving money can we create um, that rely on this kind of system of programming incentives and allowing people to transact without a third party um, authority. Um, and so that's essentially when they came up with the idea of Ethereum. And Ethereum was essentially a blockchain platform where anyone could um, write and de uh, like deploy their own programs onto it. So whatever idea you can think of, it's a general purpose computing platform. So you can deploy it on there and you can use this underlying a blockchain system uh, for whatever your applications are. Um, and that kind of really made this whole thing into the revolution that it really is, because now the opportunities or the possibilities of what you can do or the kinds of applications you can create become endless because everybody uh, can contribute and create their own applications, which is kind of what we're going to do today. So uh, let's kind of dive a little bit more technical. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about what 
smart contracts are. So smart contracts are essentially the programs that you write. Um, computer programs are basically code pieces of code that you write um, and that you deploy onto the blockchain. So in this instance, it would be the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and then these programs will essentially get executed on the blockchain. And so what I mean by executed on the blockchain means the blockchain, like I said, is just a network of a bunch of computers that are connected directly to each other. So when you're actually deploying a smart contract, you're sending this smart contract out to all the computers that are connected to, in this network, and all of those computers run those transactions or run that piece of code together at the same time, uh, and then record the result of it on their own kind of database. Um, and then this database is this like multiple instances of this database are essentially all exactly the same. So the information in them is all exactly the same. And so that's how they um, basically achieve consensus, right? Um, and so in a way you can kind of think of Ethereum as this like world computer, right? Where uh, once um, you send something out to it, it will execute because you can't take it back or you can't stop it because once, even if one of the computers that you send, let's say, you know, there's 10,000 computers that are connected to the Ethereum network. Once you take it, uh, once you connect it to one computer, um, or it deploys on one computer or executes on one computer and it gets updated to the ledger and it gets that result gets sent to everybody else. It's essentially um, a part of the history of the blockchain and it can't be taken back. Um, and so in a lot of ways, when people think about smart contracts, they're kind of confused and they're thinking about whether or not it has uh, to do with like legal contracts or if it's about taking legal kind of writings and turning them into code or things like that. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Smart contracts are just computer programs. The reason we're calling them contracts is that if you think about kind of um, a legal system, like why do people have legal documents, right? They have legal documents because they want to enforce people to do something um, to basically follow through with a particular transaction, right? So let's say if I'm selling you my house, um, I wanna have a legal contract that says, if you change the deed of your house from your name to my name, I will give you money. And if I don't do this, now this legal contract that I've signed basically says that, you know, you know, judges or the legal system has the right to punish me. And because I don't wanna get punished, I'm gonna follow through uh, and pay you basically. But with a smart contract, what ends up happening is if you basically program it into a system that says, that has access to your account and has access to, you know, the house deed files that are changing and basically says, and just does a simple if statement, right? So it just checks to see if the house deed name is changed, just deposit this much money from this account to this account. And once that contract is essentially deployed, there's no, like I said, it won't be able to be stopped. No one can stop it. And so in a way you're kind of ensuring that this transaction will process without having to enforce any kind of legal action. Um, and so that's kind of the really cool, interesting thing about um, blockchains and about smart contracts in particular, because you're basically able to take out the legal system and these kind of cumbersome systems that we've been working with, and you essentially have an alternative and you can kind of operate in a weird way, like off the grid, right? Um, which is, you know, super cool. Um, so anyways, um, moving on, we're gonna dive into the meat of, I guess, our presentation. Um, and in this coding demo, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna write a simple smart contract. Uh, we're gonna test it and deploy it uh, on a local network. Uh, we're gonna create a front end that communicates with um, the Ethereum blockchain. And then we're gonna also create um, our own uh, application that allows us to connect to our smart contract that's deployed onto the blockchain and interact with it uh, through our front end. Um, so let's get started. Cool. Um, so these are some of the tools that you'll need. Um, so obviously, oh, sorry, you'll need the uh, operating system terminal. Um, you'll need a text editor. Uh, so I'm using Atom. This is my text editor. Um, you guys can use whatever text editor that you want. Um, you'll also need a Solidity IDE. So Solidity is the language that um, we write smart contracts on, a, on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and so the Solidity IDE is, sorry, let me just bring it up. It's right here. Um, it's just a website. It's called remix.ethereum.org. So if you guys just wanna go on that website uh, and code along with me, uh, you can. <laughs> um, so let me just bring my, um, you also need Etherscan. So Etherscan is basically um, 
a kind of block explorer. So it takes all the information on the Ethereum blockchain and it kind of creates a user interface for it so that you can essentially search for any particular um, addresses on the blockchain. You can look at all the blocks that were created um, and whatever information you need from the Ethereum blockchain, you can essentially access and search for here. Um, and then uh, we're also going to use this library called Ethers.js. Um, and Ethers.js is basically going to be an interface between whatever like JavaScript applications or front end applications that we create um, and the Ethereum blockchain. So whenever we want to get data or information from the Ethereum blockchain and use it in our application, we're going to be using the Ethers.js library. And so that's essentially what we're going to walk through today. Cool. So let's get started. Um, if you guys are ready to go, we are on, oops, we're on Remix. Um, and so Remix is essentially, like I said, an integrated development environment. Um, and it's really great for uh, writing smart contracts um, and deploying them, testing them. And even if you wanted to deploy smart contracts onto the actual um, blockchain, you could actually do it from Remix. So basically Remix has um, a, like this is like a file, I guess, um, file explorer. So you basically can add a new smart contract here whenever you want. So we can add a contract here. We'll call it simple storage. It'll be a very simple application. Cool. So we've created our contract and then we have this tab down. This is where we're going to write all our code. Um, and this is going to be our console where we're going to interact with our code and see the logs of our transactions. Um, and then out here, we got this like belt where we can do a lot of uh, cool different things. So this is basically what compiles our code uh, from Solidity down to the language that actually, uh, which is like bytecode, which is like machine language, like very basic, you know, zeros and ones basically. Um, and the reason they do that is because they want the program to run in exactly the same way on all the different machines. Um, so they don't want any kind of like versioning or they don't want it to break on one computer versus another. So uh, this makes sure that it runs in exactly the same way and produces the exact same output in all the computers in the network. Um, and so this run tab is basically what we'll be working with mostly. Um, and here you can essentially, this is where you'll actually deploy your smart contracts and play with them. So you have three options here. Um, you, you can have this kind of JavaScript virtual machine, which is, uh, a sort of fake local environment that Remix creates for us. It gives us some fake accounts that we can interact with. Um, and then once we deploy our contract, uh, we'll be able to kind of interact with it. Um, if you actually wanted to deploy a contract um, to the Ethereum blockchain, you could do that as well. So you would just click this injected Web3 app, um, and then you would have to have a MetaMask account. So MetaMask is basically a wallet and uh, connect connector to the Ethereum blockchain. So here you can essentially choose the network that you want to be a part of. So the main Ethereum net would be um, the, oh, what have I done? Yeah, okay. Um, so this is like the main, uh, if, like if you wanted to uh, deploy a contract to the main Ethereum net, you could just do it like that, like I did. Um, and it would basically bring any kind of account that you have. And the reason that we need to use MetaMask here is if you wanted to actually deploy something to the real Ethereum blockchain, you would need to use gas. And gas is basically Ether um, or money, essentially. You need to pay for every kind of every transaction that you're sending to the blockchain. Um, and so that money basically goes um, to people who are going to mine those transactions for you, the fees for those miners. Um, and it also gets used up in the transact in as the compute computation is getting run. It basically gets spent as your computation is being deployed onto the blockchain. Um, and the reason for that is uh, they don't want to have kind of infinite loops or things like that happening in the block in a let's say you know you wrote some faulty code that had an infinite loop in it. And so that code would run forever and ever and would just basically uh, ruin the blockchain, right? Like it, would, it wouldn't be able to work anymore because it would just continually be running that function. So they basically have this sort of limit where it's like once you spent that limit, whatever that function is, it's going to stop and it won't, it won't execute anymore. So let's say if you had an infinite loop, after 10 seconds, you would run out of gas and then it wouldn't run anymore. Um, and that's kind of a safeguard that they've created. So that's why um, you would need money if you're deploying actual applications. So you would essentially have a wallet uh, with an account that would um, have some ether in it. I don't have any ether, uh, unfortunately, but uh, you would have some ether and then you would just essentially select it here. Oh, sorry, that was the wrong one. You select it here. Um, and then when you say 
deploy and you try to deploy your contract, everything else in Remix would operate exactly the same way. So in that, for the, okay, now that we've talked about that, uh, let's go back to our virtual JavaScript environment um, and we'll just uh, have some fake accounts with some fake ether in it that we'll uh, interact with. And then we can write our smart contract and deploy it and kind of see exactly uh, what that process is like. Cool. So the smart contract that we're going to write is called uh, simple storage. Um, and simple storage is a really, really simple contract that just uh, allows you to store some value on the blockchain um, and then view that value that you've stored. So really, really simple application. Um, so let's just get started with that. Um, sorry, let me just break this down here. Okay, cool. Um, cool. So we've created our file, simple storage. Great. We kind of had, we have it out here. Um, and I'm just going to open this up a little bit so everyone can see. Um, so the very first thing um, that we do in Solidity is we just write pragma um, Solidity um, and then a little caret and then the version of Solidity that we're using. Um, and this just basically tells um, oh, pragma, sorry, uh, there we go. Um, and this basically just tells Solidity um, or the program that's compiling it down, what version of Solidity we're using. So Solidity is just a language that's human readable and easy to use for us. So we can write programs simply, um, we can write programs easily without having to think about like ones and zeros and using like computer opcodes. But it essentially, like I said, gets compiled down. And so what this line does is it lets the compiler know which version of Solidity you're using. Because Solidity can get updated uh, and functions can change and uh, functionality can change. So it essentially tells it which version of Solidity you're using and what kind of uh, program it should be compiled down into. So once we have this line, um, to instantiate a contract is really simple. So you just say contract um, simple storage. So that's the name of the contract. Um, and then here uh, inside the contract, you can actually have uh, defined values and defined functions. Um, so if you guys have ever worked with object-oriented programming languages, uh, contract is basically like a class. So it has some met some data which you store inside the class and then it has some methods that can change uh, or manipulate that data. So the very first thing we do is we just create a data type. So we're going to call it value. Um, and so in Solidity, um, whenever you say, uh, when you define a variable, you have to say what type it is. So in this case, we have a variable called value and the type of it is string. Um, so we essentially have a string value, uh, variable. And then now we want to define a function. So we're going to call this one set value. Um, and we're going to say that it takes a string called value. Uh, cool. So like, like even inside when you're defining a function, you still have to say, every time you're putting a variable, you have to say what type that variable is. Um, and so we're going to just say um, our value is value. So we're essentially saying this variable that we defined up here um, is going to have the value of this function over here. Cool. And then here we're going to say function uh, get value. So what this is going to do is every time we call this function, we're going to call this function with a <clears throat> string value, and then it's going to set this variable on the blockchain for us. Um, and so now our next function get value um, is actually going to um, read that value back to us. So whatever this variable is, we're going to read it. So it's just a really, really simple function. So we have a constant returns string. So this constant variable basically tells us that this function is a read-only function. So it doesn't actually change anything on the blockchain. It doesn't change any, um, it doesn't change any value on the blockchain. And so because of that, it doesn't need any gas. So the only time you need gas is when you're essentially creating a transaction. And by creating a transaction, that means you're changing some value or some data on the blockchain. So if you think about the simplest transaction, like I'm giving you $5, $5 is moving from my account and going to your account. So that's a change in the state of the blockchain or in the state of the ledger because value has changed hands. But if I just want to read that I have $5, if I just want to check that I have $5 in my account, that's not a transaction, right? Because it doesn't change anything. It doesn't do anything. It's just me 
seeing something that already exists. So that's essentially what this function is. And every time you want to define a function that doesn't uh, actually do anything on the blockchain and just reads information, you would use this constant keyword. And then you would say, and then you would specify what you want that function to return. So what value do you want it to return? So here we're saying returns and we want it to return a string value, essentially this variable. Um, and so we define here exactly what we want. So we're gonna say return value and that's it. So we just wanna return this variable. Um, and so yeah, this, um, this basically just tells us um, on Solidity, you have two settings. So you can have public or private functions. Um, a private function is basically a function that um, only addresses or people that you specify um, can essentially call those functions. Otherwise, other people will be, re they, will, they will not be given access to call it. Um, but a public function means anybody on the entire blockchain can call this function and they'll be able to get a result from it. And so uh, what this kind of uh, warning is telling us is that you haven't defined uh, whether or not you want your function to be public. So it's going to be public by default. So if you don't say anything, the function's gonna be public by default. And in our case, we don't really care because this is not a sensitive function. We just you know, set a value and then read it. So it's okay if anybody can use it. Cool. Um, so that's essentially our like very simple smart contract. So let's try to deploy it and see uh, what that looks like. Cool. So we got our simple story. So this is essentially like um, how the deploying um, on Remix works. So essentially we've created the virtual environment uh, and we have an account selected. If you just were selecting injected web three, you could actually deploy this onto the real blockchain. So that's the only thing you would have to do different. And you would just have to have a MetaMask account uh, with some ether in it. Cool. So here we go. So we're going to say deploy. Um, Cool. And then now if we bring up our log, we're going to see um, that our contract was deployed. So let me just bring this up. Um, and then once it's deployed, you can see all kinds of information about it, right? So you can see, um, you know, the transaction hash, the hash of the transaction. You can see the address of the contract itself. Um, and you can also see the address of the person that sent this contract, uh, the owner of the contract, basically. So it's the person who deployed it. Um, and in this instance, it would be this address right here. And you can see right here, uh, now they don't have, they have less, uh, they, have, they have less ether because they used up some of their ether to deploy this contract onto our local blockchain. Cool. Um, and so, yeah, you have all kinds of information here that you can essentially look. And this information, every time you send a transaction to the blockchain, you will get a transaction receipt, which is essentially this thing right here that tells you exactly like how much gas you spent, um, as well as like basic information um, about the uh, transaction basically that you sent. Cool. So now that we have it here, this is the really cool part about Remix is that you can actually play with the functions right here, right? So here I can say, it's essentially like I'm calling these functions or I'm calling this trans, I'm gonna call this function right here, right? So I'm gonna give it a value, a string value, and I'll call it Nilu, which is my name, and I'll set this value. Um, and then if you look, you're gonna see that I actually created a transaction log that basically says I called this function, um, I called this uh, contract, and then I gave it this value, string value Nilu. And now if I get value, which is just reading the value back, you're gonna see I got another call that says, that returns my name, which is a string. So it's basically like, regardless of whether or not you deploy it here or you deploy it onto the real blockchain, it gives you a really nice and simple interface uh, to kind of interact with. And, it, and even this thing is really cool, right? Because every time you write something that's a bug or a mistake, or you know, you're using a version of Solidity that's outdated, it'll basically warn you right here. So it allows you, it gives you like the perfect sort of spell check or debugging tool. Um, and it's just really easy and simple to use, right? Like you just go on this website um, and you can use it. You don't have to download anything. You don't have to do anything. Um, it's a really, really great tool. So that's essentially a little bit like a very, very beginner kind of understanding of how to deploy and work with a smart contract. Obviously, there's a lot more things you can do with Solidity, um, but for our purposes, because we don't have too much time, and I wanna jump on showing you guys how to put all of this together, we're just gonna leave the contract um, at this stage. Um, cool, so now if you guys have a text editor, let's switch gears a little bit and go to our text editor, um, and we're gonna create a very simple, um, 
HTML application, Ooh, I'm so dark. <laughs> uh, we're gonna create a very simple HTML application that essentially reads the last 10 blocks, pulls the last 10 blocks from the blockchain, uh, from the Ethereum blockchain and displays them to us. Um, so let's just get started with that. Um, if you guys open your text editor, uh, you can follow along with me and then we can see what that application is gonna look like. So we're just gonna start with our basic HTML file. So doc type HTML. Um, and then we're going to define our, oh, I think I need one of these. And then I do need to define my file. HTML. So we're going to call our file, file index.html. Um, sorry, I'm in the wrong program. Sorry. Just delete this. Okay, so I'm just going to go into my terminal for a second. Um, and I'm going to create a new folder, uh, calling it Explorer for our application. Cool. So I got my folder right here. And I'm going to go into my folder now. Um, cool. And then now I'm going to open up my text editor so that I'm in the correct, <laughs> correct place. And so what I just did here, um, if you guys aren't familiar with, I'm just using the command line uh, interface. Uh, instead of going to my files and then right clicking and then adding a new folder, I'm just doing it uh, through the terminal, uh, which is, you know, it, it has a little bit of a learning curve, but um, it's a lot easier once you get used to it. So once I have my text editor, I'm just going to add a new file, call it index.html. Uh, cool, now we can actually begin <laughs> what we wanted to do in the first place. Cool, so doc type HTML. Okay, and then we, we're gonna have our HTML basically set up. And that's a really great thing about a text editor like Atom is that it auto-completes tags and it lets you know if you have uh, wrong syntax somewhere. So if you guys are familiar with coding at all, syntax is super, super important. And sometimes you could have a misplaced bracket or a misplaced semicolon in a document in like a file that's maybe like 200 lines of code or something and it's so difficult to kind of sift through all of that and like try to figure out where your mistake is so by kind of color coding everything and by giving you heads up and auto completing things um, text editors really help you be more efficient when you're coding so that's essentially why i really uh, like adam as a tool so we're going to set up our file now we're going to set up our header um, and in our header, we're going to have our title. Um, so we're going to call it Blockchain Explorer. Cool. And then in our body, we're going to have essentially a table. And this table is just going to be um, this table is just going to be the block ID, the hash of the block. Sorry, um, the number of the block, um, and the time timestamp of the block, which is in Unix time, which is second since uh, January 1st, 1971, uh, which is essentially how time is stored on the computer. They convert it for us to see in kind of like normal time, but that's how uh, information is stored in computers. Cool. So here we're going to create our table um, and it's going to be blocks. We're going to give it an ID blocks and we're going to give it a width of 100%. So that means it's going to take over the whole page. Cool. And then in here, we're going to have our uh, headers, our, our rows and our headers. So this TR means a table row and TH means table header. So here we're just going to put our information that we care about. And I'm just going to copy this and just do it three times because we have three different headers or actually. Cool. So this one's going to be hash. And then this one is going to be timestamp. Cool. And then there's our table. Um, and then so now what we actually need to do um, is we need to be able to interact with um, the Ethereum blockchain to be able to get the blocks, the latest blocks, because the latest blocks exist on the blockchain database. And we just need to be able to connect to that um, and pull that information to our application. So to do that, we're going to use something called Ethers.js, which is like I told you before, uh, this library right here. And this is a documentation for it that tells you how to use it. Um, 
And so this essentially tell, is an interface for us to be able to interact and pull data from the Ethereum blockchain. And so to access it, you have two options. You can either install it on your computer, uh, which we're not gonna do right now, or you can uh, use a CDN uh, URL or like a CDN code and just import that into your HTML file, which is what we're gonna do right now because um, it's a lot kind of faster. So I kind of pulled this from their uh, GitHub page. So if you go to the Ethers IO GitHub page, they will have uh, this kind of st a script tag for us. Uh, and then we can basically pull it um, and it will give us access uh, to the library to the to the ethers js library um, in our current file so that we can uh, so that we'll be able to use it cool so here this is cool so we got our script file basically cool so you see um, this is just like the place where it's pulling that information from and it's just saying that it wants this file to have access to that uh, essentially script cool and then so now we're going to have another script tag uh, and inside here we're going to have uh, we're going to write some essentially JavaScript code uh, and this JavaScript code is going to pull that information uh, from the Ethereum blockchain, the information about the blocks, and then it's going to populate our table with that information. Um, and the reason we're able to kind of uh, access uh, the Ethereum blockchain is because we've defined the script over here. Um, and you guys can access this by going to the Ethers IO GitHub page. Um, but if you guys want, I can also share it with you in the chat. <laughs> that might be a little bit easier for you. Um, let me see if I can find the chat. Um, how can I chat with someone here? Oh, there we go. Cool. <laughs> oh, no. Sorry, I'm going to send it to everyone. There we go. Cool. Um, so you guys should have that link now if you guys want to follow along with me. Cool. Um, so now in here, what we're going to do, the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to set our provider. Um, and we're going to use uh, Ethers uh, as a library. So Ethers.provide. So Ethers is essentially this a global variable that has that we've been given access to here. And so by saying provider, we're basically saying um, which network we're interacting with. So whenever you're writing uh, you know, an application that you want to interact with the blockchain, you have to define what network it's on, whether it's a test network, whether it's the Ethereum mainnet, or whether it's um, your, you know, local environment. And for us in this instance, it's going to be um, get default provider, which is going to be essentially the real Ethereum blockchain. So it's essentially going to just uh, call the, and the way that this is different is that the data on, for example, your local blockchain versus the main Ethereum net versus the test Ethereum net is different. So, and since you want to get that information, uh, you want to know where you're getting it from. So we're just essentially telling it, get our information from the main Ethereum blockchain. Cool. Um, and so now we're going to define two functions. So the first function that we're going to define, and obviously this is JavaScript, and you guys can see um, it's actually pretty similar uh, in terms of syntax to Solidity. And that was done on purpose to make it, to make Solidity an easy language for people to kind of work with because a lot of, basically all developers know JavaScript really well. Um, so it's kind of like easy to learn that basically. Cool, so our first function is called update blocks. And what update blocks is gonna do um, is it's just gonna get um, the, last 10 blocks uh, from the essentially Ethereum blockchain. And it's going to, um, and it's going to essentially print them, right? So we're, right now we're doing the action of fetching the blocks from the Ethereum blockchain. And this is, what, and this is where we're gonna use um, our ethers library. Um, so the very first thing we wanna do is we're gonna create a variable called last block number, and we're gonna give it our provider. Um, so we've, this is the provider that we've essentially set here. And this means that this is the Ethereum, main Ethereum blockchain. So provider get block number. So the block number function just gets the number of um, the last block if you don't pass a number to it. Um, and you guys can read um, a lot about the details of, um, the details essentially of how these functions work here. Um, but I'm just, and you guys can like look that up uh, 
essentially whenever you want and see what kind of functions are possible. But in this instance, I'm just using a few very basic functions um, just to show how the app is going to look. So then we're going to say uh, function. Um, block number. So this is the number. Um, yeah, so the block number that we've gotten, which is like we get this number, then we pass it to a new function. Um, because everything on the um, Ethereum blockchain or all the kind of with Ethers.js specifically, it returns everything asynchronously. So you need to put everything in a callback function. That means um, because uh, function, one function doesn't wait for it to end for the next one to begin. So you always need to say, um, so you always need to kind of say, hey, wait, like get this result. And even if it's doing something else, once it gets that information, then uh, uh, call the next function. Uh, because if you just put this line and then put this line, this function will try to execute before this has gotten information back. So it's not going to work. That's why we need to use this kind of format. Um, but if you guys are familiar with JavaScript, then you're probably familiar with asynchronous uh, programming as well. Um, and then inside here, inside the second function, we're just going to create a simple loop. Um, and this is how you create loops in JavaScript. So you're just going to say for a variable i at zero, and then it's going to increment uh, as long as i is less than 10, uh, incrementing by one. So that just means a loop from zero to 10. So it's going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then once it reaches 10, it's going to stop incrementing and the loop is going to stop. Um, and then inside the loop, we're going to say, we're going to get the block for the block number that we got. Um, provider get block. And then we're going to say block number minus i. Um, and so what's going on here is that this block basically gives you um, the last block, the latest block in the blockchain, right? So you're getting, let's say, you know, block 10,000. That was the last block in the blockchain. Um, and then now we want to get the last 10 blocks. So we're going to say block uh, 10,000 mi minus zero. So that's block 10,000. Um, and so once we pass that number 10,000, we actually use this get block function to get all the data about that block. So all the transactions in it, the hash, the timestamp, all that other information that we need to populate our table. Um, and then the next round, it'll say, you know, I will become one now because it increments by one. And then it'll say uh, 10,000 minus one. So 9,999. Um, and so block 9,999, it gets that information, so on, so on, so on, until it gets the la last 10 blocks on the blockchain. And once it reaches 10, uh, then this loop stops happening. So uh, we basically don't get it anymore. Cool. So then once we get that block number or that block information that we want, so the hash and everything that we want, um, then we're going to pass that resulting block into a new function. Oops, sorry, I need to say function. There we go. Um, and then here we're going to say print block. Um, block. And print block is just a function that we haven't defined yet. So we're going to write this function next, but it's basically just going to uh, take a block object and then populate it and like paste it into our table. That's essentially what that function is going to do. And we're going to go over actually how to do it right now. Um, cool. So then we got our cool. Cool. So that's essentially our first function. And then our next function, which is the print block function, print block. Um, and then we're going to pass it a block. So this function always takes a block. Um, and this function is basically just going to go, um, we're going to define a variable called table. Um, and then we're going to basically use um, uh, this function. So document dot get element by ID blocks. So we're essentially saying go into our HTML file and get the item that has the ID block. So we've kind of defined this ID here. So now we're getting this table object, essentially. Um, and now we can add rows to it. We can add data to it. Uh, we can do that in JavaScript and kind of insert data dynamically um, into our, into our index.html file um, instead of just you know, hard coding it so that it can't change. Cool. So we're going to have another variable called row. Um, and it's going to be table.insert row 
uh, negative one. So that just means you're, we're inserting a row into our table uh, at the, and the negative one means at the bottom. So every time you have negative one, it means it's the last row. So it's adding rows to the bottom of the table. Cool, and we need that. And then we're gonna say of our cell one. So this is the first cell, which is gonna be the number. Um, and we're gonna say row, Oh, so first we have to actually insert the cells, right? So we're going to say our row and we're going to call the insert cell function. Um, and we're going to say zero and zero is just like in the zeroth position. So basically in a table, you have rows and columns, obviously. So these three are our columns. Um, and so um, if you guys think about like arrays um, in computer science, everything always starts from zero. So the first position is zero, then one, two, three, four. So we're saying um, go to our row and insert a cell in the zeroth position. Um, cool. And then now we're going to just do that again for each of our, oop, there we go. So we're going to cell two and cell three. And we're going to say at position one, which is the middle position and position two, which is the last position. And then once we've kind of defined our three cells, now we're gonna populate that, those, those cells with information. So we're gonna say cell one dot inner HTML, and we're gonna say block dot number. So if you guys remember the block that we got was essentially an op, a JavaScript object um, that had a bunch of attributes. So the block is gonna have a number, it's gonna have a, a hash, it's gonna have a timestamp, it's gonna have uh, a list of transactions. It's going to have all the information that a block has. Um, and so that's essentially what Ethers does for us, right? So it gets that raw information. It puts it into a kind of JavaScript object that we can interact with and that we can display uh, in our application. Cool. So we're kind of going to do this again, like three times. Okay. So we're going to also have cell two um, and cell three. And we're going to make this one our hash and our timestamp. Cool. And so that's essentially all uh, print blocks really does. Um, it just uh, takes some blocks that we've kind of uh, the, plop, the block object that we've created or that we've gotten in this previous function, and then it uh, plops it essentially into our table. Um, and to make sure that our functions actually run, we have to um, call them out here. So we're going to say, uh, we're going to call our update blocks function right here. Um, so we're essentially calling it here, we're invoking it. Um, so this function is going to run when we load our HTML page. And then this function is going to call the print block function, which is going to get the each block and then populate our table with it. So let's see if that worked. <laughs> um, so to do that, it's really easy. Um, you can just actually open up your uh, file system. So I'm going to go to the directory that I had, um, Explorer. And I'm just going to open it up with Chrome because Chrome is a really easy. Um, there we go. Cool. Um, it looks like something is not happening, but let me just double check to see what's going on here. Um, I'm caught. Oh, sorry. Something has not been defined. Sorry. Let me just go back here and make sure that. So. Oh, what? My screen is frozen. Sorry, guys. Oh, no. Uh, it looks like my screen is frozen. I can't do anything on my computer. Let's give me one second. Oh, shit. Um, I may have to join the meeting again uh, in a little bit. It just looks like my computer is completely frozen. Um, Yeah, just I, I will I will just gonna restart my computer and then come back again just because it looks like my computer just froze. Oh, that can't even turn it off. That's crazy. Okay, thank you, Nilu. Yeah, try to restart your computer. Yeah. Uh, I will pause with the recording and then I will wait until you come back. Okay, perfect. Yeah, just because I can't even like turn my computer off right sure. now. Sure. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Thank yeah. you. Sorry about that.
hey guys, uh, sorry about that. That was such a weird <laughs> thing. I've never experienced that before. My computer just like froze and then it wouldn't turn off. But anyways, um, I've brought everything back up. So where we left off, we were on this Chrome um, page. Let me just bring up the index.html file again. Um, and it wasn't working. I think it was because I just had a small typo. So I just fixed that. And I'm gonna show you guys what the typo was right now. So I'm gonna open it with Google Chrome. There we go. So here we're getting the, um, okay, we're getting all of our then block numbers. Oh, sorry, I'm not sharing my screen with you guys. Um, share my screen, there we go. Share, perfect. Okay, so this is the page that we were supposed to see. Um, the issue with it was that I actually had a small typo. So here um, I had written ethers provider. And so ethers provider isn't an object in the ethers library. So it was just returning undefined because it couldn't find it. The actual correct thing is ethers providers because it's looking through all of their providers and then it's getting the default provider, which is the Ethereum, uh, for, like with, which is the Ethereum mainnet. Um, so I just kind of fixed that little typo. Um, and then now we're able to get our page with all the information that's getting pulled from the blockchain. And what you guys can do um, is you can actually go on etherscan um, and you can kind of look at uh, the last blocks and like the latest block number, which is this number right here. And you can see that we have this number right here as well. Um, and the reason that they're, that they're not in order is like I said, um, job, like the objects that Ethers.js returns are not in, syn in synchronous order. So they're not coming back in order. So for example, one block might return faster than another one. So it's just putting them in as soon as it gets them. So that's why they're not in chronological in like correct order basically, because they're not happening synchronously. Cool, so that's essentially how you would get um, information from the blockchain using the ethers uh, JS library. Um, you can use other libraries like Web3, but they're essentially the same. The interface might be a little bit different, but they perform the same function. Um, and if you guys wanna learn about what other kinds of functions you can do with um, ethers.js, you can go here and you can look at all the methods at the docs.ethers.io. Um, and you can see all the methods that you can implement basically uh, with ethers.js. Um, and the one last thing I wanted to show you guys is um, essentially how to interact with a smart contract that you deploy. So what we've done so far is we've actually taken public information or like information about the blockchain. So how many blocks there are, uh, what are the hashes for them? So essentially just the ledger and we're reading them in our application. But let's say you wanted to interact with a smart contract. Let's say I, we wanted to call, for example, um, we have this function right here that we created, right? So um, in our remix, there we go. So let's say we wanted to call one of these functions and essentially uh, call them the same way that we were doing it when we were deploying um, our contracts. Um, and how would we do that from a front end? Let's say we want to click a button on a website and we wanted to call a function in our smart contract. How would we do that? Um, and so to do that, um, I'm going to kind of walk you guys through it. You would basically need to use Ethers, uh, Ethers JS to retrieve your contract from the Ethereum blockchain um, and then create an image of it locally and then call those functions uh, and then send calls, which the Ethereum JS library will actually send to the blockchain and then call those functions. So let's just see what that looks like uh, in a simple application. Um, and so we're gonna create a function here then and we're gonna call it function uh, get value. Um, and this get value is gonna mirror uh, this get value that we have here. So we're basically gonna tell it um, hey, get, uh, read whatever value this smart contract has. And so for this purpose, what we've actually done is we've actually uh, deployed a version of this contract, of this exact contract, onto the real Ethereum blockchain. Obviously, we couldn't do it for our tutorial here because to actually deploy it on the blockchain, you will need to have uh, gas and ether, uh, which uh, probably, like, which I didn't have, so I couldn't do it. But if you actually, the only difference between how, what we did here and how to actually deploy it on the real blockchain is just going here saying injected web three and then having this uh, MetaMask plugin installed. Oh, did my, I think my MetaMask just quit. My computer is acting up so crazy today. But um, anyways, uh, doesn't really matter. Let me just bring that back up again. Cool, so let me just, uh, I'm just gonna bring up the 
uh, kind of uh, what I was going to tell you guys that we actually deployed the smart contract onto um, the Ethereum blockchain for real, uh, and we can actually call it now um, and basically see the functions as it is on the Ethereum blockchain. So let me just bring my uh, Firefox back up here, uh, and I'm going to go to Etherscan. Um, and so when we deployed our contract, we actually deployed it uh, and we got a contract address from it. So I'm just going to share that contract address with you guys so you can go and see it um, as well. So to search for a particular contract or anything or an account or anything, you would just go here. You would type in the address of it um, and then you would basically search. And you can see here all the transactions that happen in this contract. And this is on the real Ethereum blockchain. So this is, I'm on Etherscan right now. Um, and then you can see the actual source code, which is, this is exactly the source code that we wrote together. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you can see all kinds of like uh, features about it. You can see this ABI, which we're gonna use as we're gonna engage with it on our front end application. Um, what else? So that's basically uh, it here. So let me just share that address with you. I'm going to send it to uh, the group chat and you guys can go on Etherscan yourselves and, and pull up the contract page. Uh, cool. So let me just go to everybody. Cool. So this is the um, contract address. So if you guys just paste that, go to Etherscan, paste it, you'll be able to come to this contract page. And so what we're going to do is we're going to call, um, and you can see this last transaction. Um, if we go look at it, it'll basically tell you, um, and you can view decoded, right? So it basically says this, and guys, remember the transactions are only um, the set value function. So it's only the things that change the value on the blockchain. So not the reading function that we're gonna do. Uh, but so for example, the last transaction happened 16 hours ago, um, and it basically changed the value of this function. So to foo bay foo, Bugatti foo, so whatever the string is, right? So somebody essentially paid some ether and changed uh, the string to this on the blockchain. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna see if our application can read the string. So we're gonna see if we can get our get value function to print this out to our application. Um, so let's just get uh, started back with it. Um, so we've kind of set up our function here. And the very first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create a variable and give it our contract address. And that's just the address that I sent for you guys um, in the chat. So it's the address of our contract that exists on the blockchain. So that's essentially how the ethers library is going to find our contract. Um, then we're going to say contract ABI. Um, contract ABI. And this is basically this object right here. So if you guys go to etherscan again, um, let's go back here to the uh, contract page and you go to the code. Um, so you got the source code right here and then you have this thing called the contract ABI and the contract ABI is basically sort of like a mirror object or an interface. So it's, it actually stands for application binary interface. And what it does is, is it's this kind of JavaScript object that tells, um, that tells the kind of, that tells our application or our library what functions to what functions exist in the contract. It's sort of a mirror of the contract. So if you see, it tells you, you know, it's got this, these functions and these are the inputs that it takes. And it's essentially like a kind of map to the way the smart contract actually works because we don't have, our application doesn't actually have access or Ethers doesn't actually have access to the smart contract. So it has this kind of like uh, mirror or map where it knows what functions it can call. And then what, when it calls that function, it just deploys that function to the blockchain and then uh, the blockchain essentially enacts it, right? Um, whereas, you know, because you're spending money with these functions and stuff, you want to make sure that you have the correct function. So, the Ethers uh, API is, is essentially acting blind, right? Because that information on the blockchain is hashed. Um, but this way, you're essentially getting all the information about like what functions you can call. So that's why um, you basically need the ABI. So we can just copy it here. We've copied it to our clipboard, and then in our text editor. Uh, we can basically just uh, paste it in. Um, and so this is essentially what the ethers library is going to use to know what functions um, it can call uh, for a contract. So, and then we're going to have our contract. And so this is essentially when we're using the ethers library. So we're going to say new ethers contract. Um, and that's how you would uh, do it uh, to get to essentially instantiate a new contract. And you're going to say, and you're going to give it the contract address and the contract ABI. So these are the only two things 
uh, that ethers the ethers library needs to be able to kind of uh, so this tells it what functions it can send and this tells it where it needs to send those functions so that's essentially what it needs because it's sending whatever calls you're you're giving and actually sending them to the ethereum blockchain cool so now that we have our contract set up uh, we can actually just call our contract uh, our contract ends up being a sort of object that has functions in it that we can invoke so we're going to have our contract and we're going to call our get value function in it. So now this contract essentially has all the functions uh, that we had in our remix. So we can actually call this function. Um, so when we're saying a contract get value, we're calling this function right here, um, which is essentially this right here from the API. Um, cool. So then, then we're going to get value. And then once we have a result, then we're going to put it in a new function. We're going to get a result, put it in a new function. And then we're going to print it to our console. So we're going to say console log, and we're going to say get value returned. And then we're going to give it our results. Space. So it should return that uh, foo string that we saw on the blockchain. So let's see, it works, and hopefully my computer does not crash and die again. Uh, cool. So we're going to do this again. So we've got our blocks and you can see they're different now because we're getting this information in real time. Uh, and then we're gonna go to our console because we told it to log it into our JavaScript console. Um, oh, we just have to do one thing, which I forgot to do, uh, which is we have to call the function here, right? So if we want get value to get implemented, we're gonna have to call it here. So we're gonna say update block and then get value. So now that we have this here, let's go back to our Chrome page. Do it one more time, oh no. Missing signer or provider. Why am I missing signer or provider? All right, let me just make sure that I've gotten everything correctly. No equals contract here. Why am I missing signer or provider? Let me just double check this. Oh, you have to pass the provider as well. Sorry, guys. So you basically need to pass. Um, this is a new API. So before you only had to pass the address and the um, ABI, but they just made some updates to the Ethers uh, contract recently that basically needed a provider as well. And so that just means that now you're giving it the address of where you want the contract to call that function. Uh, you also are passing it the ABI, which is um, kind of what function you wanted to call. And then you're also passing the provider. And if you guys remember, we set the provider up here and it just tells us which network we're on. So you're essentially giving this ethers library the exact address of where to go and what to do and, and on which network. So our provider in this instance is the default provider, which is the Ethereum mainnet, which is essentially the network that we're seeing uh, on etherscan here as well. Cool, so now that we've hopefully got it all figured out, let's just save this um, and make sure that it works. Cool, and then if you guys look here, I don't know if you can see it. Um, so you see get value returned foo bay foo fugati foo. So that was actually, um, if we go back here to the last transaction, you can see, oh, too big. Um, you can see that this was the last transaction input that was put into this function in the real blockchain and you can actually see like uh the actual gas so they paid nine cents of gas to essentially uh make this function happen um and yeah so that's essentially um everything uh for our presentation so sorry about the crazy like technical difficulty in the middle there but hopefully you guys get a good idea of what's possible to do like everything that i've done here is super super simple so you know, especially the smart contract that we created um, and how we attached it to the blockchain or like interacting with the blockchain or the functions that we use. It's very, very basic, but I just wanted to give you guys an overall sense of how all these pieces work together. So where Remix comes in, how you deploy your smart contract using MetaMask. And then if you have a, if you have a contract or application page, how once you deploy your contract, can your application interact uh, with the smart contract that you have um, so that your application can actually essentially be on the blockchain. Um, and yeah, if you guys have any questions, I think we're, uh, we're actually right on time, which is perfect. Um, but yeah, uh, let me just leave uh, my last uh, thing here for you guys. But 
I guess, yeah, I don't have that page anymore since my computer crashed, but uh, you guys can definitely um, check out our courses. We, I had a coupon code for you, uh, which I'm going to share with you in the chat. I was going to leave it on the screen here, but my screen is not there anymore, so I'm just going to share it with everybody. Um, and our coupon code is crypto chicks 09 2018 um, it's valid till this friday and it gives you guys a hundred dollars off our annual or two-year plan um, and like i said uh, you guys can um, you know we update our courses super quickly and we're super hands-on with trying to you know give everyone like face-to-face -face time and talking to everyone and we have a lot of cool partner courses as well so you guys can check all that stuff out on the blockings platform um, I don't know if we have time for questions, but regardless, you guys can email me or reach me on Twitter. So I'm going to send you guys my email as well. So my email is neil at blockgeeks.com, which you guys can reach me at. Um, and you guys can also find me on Twitter at nrevai. Um, if you guys want to talk to me or, you know, I sometimes post articles on there if you guys want to follow or if there's events that Blockgeeks is doing, uh, I'll be posting about those as well. Um, and Block block geeks is also the block geeks twitter if you guys want to follow that as well um and yeah hopefully you guys enjoyed this webinar that's everything uh and if you guys have any questions uh i'm definitely available via email uh, to chat with you guys thanks so much Thank you so much, guys. Uh, so if you have any questions, I, I see like people start leaving. So if you have any questions, uh, Nilou is still here. Uh, if, so please um, type in the chat. Otherwise, please send her an email. Oh, yeah, so I have one, I have one question uh, just generally to me. Uh, is using Solidity okay for the hackathon and or the bounty? Yes, it's okay. Okay, any other questions? Again, if you have any, please uh, send message to Nilou, uh, send message to us uh, at stay in touch at Pictures dossier. We will forward it and we will share it with everybody. So this recording also of the session will be shared with everybody on, uh, and the uh, uh, on, that on the hackathon list. Uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, we will see you on Wednesday for another workshop. Thank you, bye-bye.